that merges with um, landscape architecture. And uh, thank you for, for joining us. And if you miss any of this or you have to leave early, please just come back and check us out on our YouTube channel. I will post this uh, later this evening on our YouTube so you can rewatch it and share it with anybody that uh, you think might be interested. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Julie. I'm uh, ready to roll here. My, however, your picture's in the upper right. I think mine should be, but whatever, probably doesn't matter. Um, Hello to all of you. I've uh, thank you for joining us here today. Um, I've given this talk many times, but never on Zoom. So uh, over the past year, I have seen a lot of people that are giving their first Zoom presentation. So I don't, I don't feel like I'll be too blundering with that. But I'm glad you're all here. Thank you. Um, planting for life: How to make your yard your bird feeder. And um, I like to start by mentioning how it started for me. Why I got into this, why I created this presentation. Uh, so how it began for me, and, and do respond in the chat box. If you respond very quickly, I'll, I'll be able to pick it up. But how it began, began for me was about uh, 25 years ago. I was laying in bed one morning, early morning, and I looked out actually on a pile of wood and sitting on that pile of wood was a beautiful little bird. And I snuck over into my next, my next room and I grabbed my binoculars and I came back and I focused and this is what was there. Now, anybody know what this bird is? This is a male painted bunting. They winter down here in the, in the winter time along with the females. And so what I did for him was I put the wood away and I planted red pentas. So it was a bird, he needs red flowers, so I planted red pentas. Now, any of you birders out there, do you know what red pentas supply for painted buntings? Absolutely nothing. So that is where I began knowing nothing. But I got to the point where I had about uh, 15 painted buntings wintering in my yard every year. And when people would hear that, and, and a lot of people do, I'm certainly not the only one, that's for sure. But when people would hear that, they would say, oh my gosh, what kind of seed do you put out? And I would say, it's not the seed, it's the yard. You need to create a habitat and an ecosystem and an environment where they're safe and provided for and comfortable and then they'll come. And then the last thing you want to put out uh, is the feeder. So I started creating, uh, I started creating habitat for birds. Now I'm not able to back, although I can back up. So, so then I like to ask, why do we want birds in our yard anyhow? What does it supply for us? And I'm used to having people I can speak with, but anyhow, it, uh, uh, different answers are they're beautiful, they have great songs, they're entertaining. Uh, we feel we're adding to their environment of which so much has been taken from them. We're helping them on migration. So it's kind of easy to see through our eyes why we would want to create a habitat for them. But I, I want to do a little twist on that and I want to look at it through their eyes. Why do they want us to create habitat for them? So let's look at it through the bird's eyes. And what we'll do for that is jump up in the sky and go on migration. And not migration today, but migration really anywhere from 300 to 20,000 years ago along the North American continent or 10,000 years ago. So get your wings, let's jump up and go flying and see it through their eyes. So we'll start up in New England. It's become fall. It's time to head south for the, winter, for the summertime. And pretty much every place that we fly over, if it's our ecosystem, we can land and refuel everywhere. Imagine that, everywhere. Every place is pristine habitat where we can get our fuel, where we can get water, and we can travel on. 
This is um, the Central Prairie. Look how much of the continent that it covered initially before European settlement. The Grass Prairie. This is the Upper Kissimmee River Basin, the section of it that has been restored. Shoreline, shorebirds, all land and refuel. Julie and I work for shorebirds. And then there was just one road, just one road in the forest. And then there were two roads. And then just a few houses. And then a few more houses. And then there was land that was actually made for houses. And the houses filled it up and filled it up. Now you're a tiny songbird and you've been flying for 500 miles and you're exhausted and you're starving and you need to refuel or you probably won't make it. And this is what you're flying over. And this is the downtown, this is the beach. So rapidly their world changed. What they needed for survival vanished. Their refueling stations disappeared and their populations crashed. Yards became a critical component in songbird and bird survival. But then we need to ask what kind of yard. So here's a yard. This is probably considered really a nice yard. So the American lawn is now the single largest crop in the United States, covering three times larger than any other irrigated crop. Covers 63,000 square miles, offering, uh, often requiring fertilizer, mowing, and water. And so the solution is simple for changing this into a wildlife friendly environment. Decrease lawn, increase native plant landscapes. Because if you build it, they will come. All of these birds are birds that are seen in South Florida. These are warblers. This is a Canada warbler. It's, it's seen the least often here. Of course, the cardinals are here. Perula, male Perula warbler, and our wonderful spot-breasted oriole. So all of these birds you could have in your yard. So by incorporating 10 basic principles, we can create a safe, livable environment for birds by developing a landscape with multidimensional functional amenities. Amenities are happening all at the same time. So I'm going to go through these 10. The first is biodiversity, greater variety of plants, greater variety of birds. And we all have different sizes of yards and different capacities. Some of us may already only have a balcony, which can also be very functional. So whatever you have, you want to try to survive, survive, uh, provide as much of this as you can. So seeds, berries, nectar, insects. Insects are really, really important for birds, especially when they're feeding their young. All, all birds that I know of when they're young or small feed them insects as a, as a protein source for them to grow. So fruit, flowers, nuts, and cover. That's biodiversity. And the second is create a layered or tiered landscape. If you walk out in nature, unless it's a real specific ecosystem like a mangrove forest or the grasslands, uh, but when you walk out in nature, you will see that there's a tiered landscape. There are tall trees, there are short trees, there's understory, there's ground cover. So there's this whole thing that provides different <clears throat> layers of the habitat for different birds to utilize all at the same time. So it's kind of like if any of you have gone to Epcot Center and um, let's see if I can, there we go. If any of you have gone to Epcot Center and you walk in with a bunch of friends and let's say somebody wants waffles with um, strawberries and somebody else wants a veggie burger and somebody else wants a steak and you know, so you all walk in and you all want different things. And then you go different places and you eat different food. That's what you can create in your yard. You can create an Epcot Center for birds so that there's different layers of the canopy, different types of food, different types of seed. So all the birds that eat in a different manner 
such as a warbler eats very different than a, than a cardinal, who has a conical bill for cracking seeds. You can, have, you can be providing for all these different birds that eat all different ways at all different layers of the canopy, all simultaneously. And nature is very interesting because, because birds feed differently, they can feed in the same place and not interfere with one another. So it's a, it's a really beautiful thing that, that we can work and create. So here we have the um, canopy, the upper canopy, the canopy, and the different bird species that are found all the way down to ground cover. And we'll scoot through these different um, layers here. So first is the tall upper canopy, the large tree. This is gumbo limbo. It's a great native in South Florida. It's a very, very good bird tree. And then we have uh, also our upper canopy trees, live oak. Look at that. Beautiful live oak. That's probably in North Florida. And then I think this is a type of maple. So these are our upper canopy trees. Then we come down to the mid story. Or here, here we have, we'll, first we'll talk about the, often where we have in parks, we will have the upper canopy and then we have, we'll have lawn. So, and here's a kind of real big example of that upper canopy and lawn. So what happens here is you have the top and the bottom and everything in between is missing. So all the things that the birds need to get up to the upper canopy is missing. A huge amount of the ecosystem here is not there. So what we want to do is fill that in. And these are some of the birds that are found in the upper, upper canopy. All of these come to South Florida. Uh, the perula and the yellow-throated warbler actually winter here. Maybe you've had some of these in your yard. Then the shorter mid-story. And these are some of the birds found there. I've actually had a ruby crowned kinglet in my yard. He puts up that little feather crest when he's a little irritated. And then the understory, shorter shrubs. And note that, note that here is just life. It's not trimmed, it's not edged, it's not blown, it's not cut. It's all those things that we're taught is the proper way to have a yard. Uh, that's not so in, in, in a British garden. In the English garden, you just have stuff growing. It's a very different concept here, I think largely due to marketing. We have lawns that are very straight, very trimmed, very organized, which creates lawnmowers, blowers, you know, lots of, lots of work to make it be that way rather than just let it grow. And that's one thing I really try to express is just let it grow and not be so concerned about it being so pristine. Uh, these are some of the birds found in the understory. Wild coffee is an excellent bird plant that is a native. Wonderful, different types of wild coffee. Um, but this is the main one here. This is our state bird, the mockingbird. And also in the understory, if you look carefully, this is where the fairies live. So that's a very important part of the canopy. And then we go on to grasses, flowers, ground cover. So we're stepping down through all the different layers. These are some of the birds that you will find in that area. Muley grass, a great native, native uh, plant here. And an oven bird, maybe some of you, you've seen these in your yard, they're here now. Uh, this is a warbler and it walks on the ground kind of like a chicken. It picks its feet up, it's great. A uh, great bird. And this is also where the trolls live. So when you're walking through this part of your yard, step carefully. And then leave the leaves. Oh my goodness. So what many, what I see many people doing is they go out and rake their leaves or blow them uh, into a pile and then they put them in a plastic bag and then they set them out for yard waste or, or landfill. And then they go to Home Depot and they get uh, fertilizer and mulch. And they're replacing artificially what they just took out of their yard. Leaf litter is so important. Please, please leave it. If it's, a, if it's in a place you don't want it, rake it up, put it around your flower beds. It creates an entire ecosystem. It's critical habitat for wildlife and birds. It turns into rich hummus and nutrients resoil back into the 
re recycled back into the soil and feed the plants. And when you have a nice thick layer of, of leaf litter, you'll see the birds um, digging in there and pulling out the bugs and the, and the worms. And there are many birds that feed there. So leave the leaves. And then bare ground. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever seen a bird laying on the ground with its wings spread out uh, very close to bare ground. It would, be, it would be maybe on grasses like this or bare ground. And you think, oh my goodness, something's wrong. And you go up and it flies away. Anybody know what this bird is doing? It's doing something called anting. And this is a normal behavior. When birds spread their wings out, they lay on the ground. And actually, it's a very symbiotic relationship where the ants crawl up onto their feathers and eat the little mites and bugs that are on them. So this is not an injured bird. This is not a bird that needs to come to Wildlife Care Center. It's a regular practice. And also dust baths on bare ground. So that's the whole canopy from the upper canopy all the way down to the ground. As much of that as you can do in the yard you have will help the bird life. Okay, number three, maximize plant edges. As we spoke about a little bit, avoid straight lines. Create meandering lines where different plant types meet. This is called an ecotone. So you want to maximize both on the horizontal and the vertical. So here is a horizontal edging, and here is vertical as it steps up. So all of these are areas that are going to be attractive to birds. There's another nice example. I'm sure we don't all have yards like this, but it's just an example of stepped up vegetation going up to the canopy. And then they're kind of borrowing the, the backyard, which I guess is a park or something. But a very nice example of meandering lines, stepped up vegetation. And then use and create microclimates. So what is a microclimate? It's just, a, it's just an area that uh, the, the temperature or the climate differs from the surrounding area. So microclimates are everywhere in nature. Uh, when we have our Arctic winds blow in the winter down here in South Florida, the northwest side of the house will be more windy and cooler. The southeast part of the house will be less windy and, and less chilly. So that's an ecotone set up by an artificial structure. A valley bottoms, the bottom of a valley is an ecotone, the top of a mountain, different sides of a tree. That's a different ecotone. So here these people have created a different climate in here where they have trees above, uh, making it shady and less windy and less rainy. They have trees around it uh, and bushes. And in here they chose to put their birdhouse. So this is maximizing of the use of a microclimate. So like humans, birds have climate preferences. Create spaces that are densely planted um, and open that will prevent wind and weather protection. Because most songbirds prefer to be protected from rainfall and strong winds. So any anyhow, you can have this created in your yard. You can even utilize the sides of your house. And then finally, place feeders in climate protected area. So I love this picture because there's a wall on either side. There are no windows, which is great. There's this little balcony up above and then below it is hanging the bird feeder. And very, very importantly, there are all kinds of bushes for the birds to fly into. Because as we probably all know, bird feeders are hawk restaurants and it pulls in hawks like crazy. And so the birds need to have cover to fly to very close to the, to the feeder. So you want it away from prevailing winds with sun exposure. And we'll talk a lot more about this, but two feet or 25 feet away from windows. The two feet or less is because if a, if a bird takes off and it flies into a window from two feet away, it will not have the momentum to harm it. And that's, a, that's the, one of the topics coming up we'll talk about is windows. So by varying feeder size, type, placement and food choice, and also plant choice. Different bird species use your yard simultaneously. So you can look out and see the high canopy birds, like the yellow-throated warbler, uh, the perula, that'll be up in the canopy. You'll see the oven bird on, your, on the ground walking along like a little chicken, and you can just see a whole entire 
habitat out there happening, especially during migration. So as with people, a comfortable eating space attracts more folks than other. What we want to do is create a comfortable yard for the bird, and then they come. So would you rather eat here, or would you rather eat here? The same, th same thing with a bird. He looks for a place that's comfortable and safe. So these are just different types of feeders, different types of birds you can pull in with your different types of feeders. And provide perching sites near feeders. So unlike, you know, some people, uh, we don't just, birds don't just walk right into a plate of food and start eating. Um, almost always, birds fly near the food, they perch, they look and see if they're safe, and then they will fly from the perch to the feeder. So that's really easy to provide. It can be bushes, trees, snag, it's a fence, it can be all kinds of things. But something to say you can fly in and perch, look around, be safe. Uh, you don't ever want to have a situation where you're providing food that forces the bird into an unsafe situation. And I've seen before where people have a big, huge lawn, and then they put one of those little hooks out in the, in the middle of the lawn, and then from the hook they hang a bird feeder. So what they're asking the bird to do is fly all the way from any vegetation there is out into open lawn where there's no protection to feed. And that is really a good hawk restaurant. That, 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 the hawks love that. So these are birds that require perches. Uh, we get all of these in South Florida. Not so much the vermilion flycatcher, that's, that's kind of rare. They have come here though. And then provide clean water. So running or dripping water will attract more birds. And really it should be rinsed out every two or three days. Uh, you don't want to be breeding mosquitoes. You want to have clean water, and you'll get great antics there. Lots of baths and and fun fun things going on. And this is huge. Reduce or eliminate herbicides, pesticides. I haven't sprayed my yard in 30 years. Um, I do get you know some bugs that I don't want, like the tent caterpillars and stuff, and that I just cut off. You know, just trim that and. So um, if you plant native plants, that will host native insect species. And that's important because that's what our native birds are looking for. They're looking for food that's familiar to them. They're looking for plants that are familiar to them. And uh, insects are critical to most bird species, especially when raising their young. I watched um, a mockingbird feed her young in, in one of my bushes several years ago, really intensely. I, I paid attention to the food sources. And for the first 10 days, she brought in birds. I, I'm sorry, for the first 10 days, she brought in bugs and insects. And then after 10 days, she started bringing in fruit. So it's a critical food source for young, uh, young birds. And all of these have an insect in their mouths. Canada warbler, Eastern bluebird, I believe that's a red-eyed vireo, and this is a very small flycatcher. <laughs> we thought so. All right, this one is really, really huge. Make windows visible. How many of you have had, uh, let me see if I can make this happen, chat, okay. Um, how many of you have ever had a bird <clears throat> crash into your window? How did you feel about that? <clears throat> how many of you have ever walked into a sliding glass door? And you know what glass is, and you knew it was there. Birds don't know what glass is, and they can't see it. So collisions with windows are a major threat to birds. Roughly 1 billion birds are killed annually in the United States, with over 60% of those mortalities at residence. That's us. That's our home. Um, so for birds, windows are worse than invisible. By reflecting foliage, they look like a very inviting place to fly into because of the sheer numbers of windows, their troll on birds is huge. So there are basically two types of window collisions. By day, where birds are low, they tend to be three stories or less because that's where they're feeding during the day and raising their young. Ground, they're, on, they're close to the ground. Uh, by day, birds fly into windows because they see a reflection or they see through to the other side. So it's the lower structures. By night, and we've probably read about 
instances, like there was a horrible instance, I think in Houston a few years ago, where 400 birds in one night were killed on one building. And that was migration. And the building was lit up and it pulled the birds in. It was a stormy, uh, overcast, um, very humid situation. And they crashed into the building. <laughs> a lot of Blackburnians and a lot of warblers. So by night, birds hit lighted windows because they're drawn to the light. Think about it before us, just like sea turtles and birds and other animals, they use stars and the moon to help them orient their migration. So now we have all these lights going all over and it, it can be very distracting for them. So in a lighted area, they can uh, mill around and collide with one another or the lighted structure. So that's not so much us because that's us talking to our commissioners and changing ordinances, but that's not for our home. So uh, annual human caused bird deaths, this is a Parula. This is actually a banded black and white warbler, hermit thrush, cats by far are the number one human cause of bird mortality after habitat destruction. And buildings and glass, here they have 600,000. It's more, it's closer to, uh, no, they have, I'm sorry, here they have 600 million. It's closer to a billion now. And this, this is a really great website. I, any of you that really are, you know, there's so many things we can do to help birds and they need us so very badly that the more you feel called to do um, is great. There is a wonderful program that was started in the 80s in Ontario called Fatal Light Awareness Program. Uh, it's a Lights Out. Maybe you've heard about the Lights Out Chicago, Lights Out New York. Many, many cities now in the United States have adopted this. And what this is a, a, a photograph of is Fatal Light Awareness Program has volunteers in Ontario and through all of North America and different countries that go out during migration to tall downtown buildings and collect the birds that are injured or killed by that building the night before. And what Ontario does is they collect all the birds that were killed that season. They make a display in the front entrance to the Royal Ontario Museum so that all the residents of Ontario can see what the, you know, it's easy to look away and here they look at it. And um, so this was one season, one city, one migration, the birds you're seeing there. So the great news is there are solutions and they're easy and they're available and they're quick. Um, so it's, I lost my pointer, there we go. So uh, closed blind, let's see, what did I miss here? So here we have decals. Somehow I've lost my pointer. So we have decals in the upper left and this gentleman's putting on squares, um, closed blinds. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. And I should say that not all windows are created equal. If you walk around your house, you'll see the sun and the glare and the foliage are very different on different windows. And some windows have really no problem at all. Probably most windows have no problem. I had only two windows on my house that killed birds and uh, I have different methods on them to stop that, but it has been completely stopped and I'll, I'll show you one of them coming up. My, my favorite really down here is uh, the lower right and um, those are Zen wind curtains and that is what I have at my house. Here's Zen wind curtains. They're also called Acropian bird savers. So there is, um, there's the website. And quickly, how this was designed was uh, a family in the 70s who actually were engineers in the 1970s were very, very uh, distressed about the number of birds that hit their window. Um, and they decided to come up with a solution. So what they did then was the, I don't know if we can remember back or how old all you are, but um, remember the beads? We had like peace beads and <laughs> the peace beads. They did long strings of peace beads four inches apart across their window and they noted immediately that stopped all window strikes. Well then the peace beads kind of fell apart and that what they used then was parachute cord. So this is my front window 
Along the top is a, a bamboo piece. My neighbor was cutting down bamboo. So I said, oh my gosh, that's long and straight. That'll be perfect. I drilled the holes through it three and three quarters inches apart rather than four. I hung it up. I got the parachute cord online. You can read all about it at this website, birdsavers.com. This whole thing cost me maybe 10 bucks and it immediately stops bird strikes. It is very effective. It must be on the outside. You can see how reflective, especially the lower right picture, you can see how reflective it is. And then that's a picture looking out from the inside. So it's actually super cool looking and very effective and very inexpensive. You can make your own or you can buy them, but they're so easy to make that I would do that. And also on the same website, these are just tape that you can put on your window. Again, three, four inches apart. So this is a guideline for bird safe windows, vertically four inches, horizontally two inches. Sometimes verticals or mini blinds inside will work, but often when you look from outside, the glare overrides what is inside. So really what's inside is not very, it's not necessarily very effective. So um, you need to have your treatment outside. Now birds are covered with dust and as we can imagine, they can have a little bit of dust and debris on them. This lower picture is a bird that hit full on into a window, straight on, you can see his feet. That's called a, a dust angel or a, a dust impression that is left by a window strike by a bird. And if you look at your windows carefully, you can sometimes see these. So here's other things you can hang on windows. And I'm just gonna read this because I like to uh, really enunciate how critical this is. This is a Canada warbler. They don't usually migrate through Florida, but this was four years ago and a friend of mine who's a econ professor at FIU and an excellent birder, uh, went to work one morning during migration and on the third floor of his economics building, he found this bird and sent it to me. So that was my first text in the morning, like seven in the morning. And um, I said to him, oh my gosh, you got to put up uh, a decal or something. And he said, I don't have a decal. <laughs> so I said, well, then I'll make one. So I printed out the picture and I put this next to it and I sent it to him and he put it up in the window. Now it will, other than that, every person that walks by there will be educated. So this is what it said. I am a Canada warbler. I was on my migration from Eastern Canada south nine six on nine six sixteen I flew into this window and was killed. Windows are walls of death for us. Please help us keep blinds hold or put decals on windows so we can see them. It means our life. And this is the migratory route of the uh, Canada warbler. You can see normally it doesn't even come through Florida. And number nine, keep cats indoors. Feral and free roaming domestic cats kill about 2.4 billion birds a year. There are approximately 100 million feral cats in the United States decimating our wildlife. It's very, very critical. Keep cats indoors bring them in, create a happy, safe space for them. Um, this is the number one killer of birds in the country other than habitat loss. <clears throat> so many baby birds spend time on the ground while they learn to fly. As you certainly know, being connected with Wildlife Care Center, they're, they haven't learned to fly yet, but they have fledged, especially mockingbirds. And so you'll see, you'll see them hopping on the ground before they get into a bush and climb up the bush, which is why they need the tiered um, landscape to get up to the higher parts of the canopy. And while they're doing this, it makes them very vulnerable to cats and their parents that are trying to protect them. And, oh, this is a great, great website. Um, American Bird Conservancy. Maybe you can take a picture of this screen and then look them up, abcbirds.org. Uh, they have really good information um, American Bird Conservancy, their cat program. And number 10, this is a very personal uh, story. 
in um, in in the fall of 2014, my 60 foot coconut palm tree was struck by lightning. And um, I was actually pretty happy about that because I knew it would be a great habitat. And with time, all the fronds fell. And by uh, the end of uh, February 15, three days after the last frond fell, a pair of red-bellied woodpeckers found the tree. This became the love of my life. This is Papa. And that's him and the female on the tree there on the right. Um, their first baby was born in July. And that is a male. You can see a little bit of red on the front part of his forehead. And uh, the male tends to do, the, the adult male tends to be the poop duty guy. So they take in, they both take in the food and he takes out the food. And boy, he kept that place very tidy. Woodpeckers like very clean cavities. And so he was super busy. And then we actually also got to see the moment of pledge. So here, this, this, I had a friend of mine, the same birder, who's the econ professor. Um, he was there photographing this little guy the moment it fledged, and which is about a 20 second ordeal. So here he comes, there he's out, and now he's out. So now, uh-oh, is that the fire one? I was told that might go off. <laughs> oh, we have all kinds of distractions. So here's the little guy outside. The mother is flying in to feed him. But he's, she's not going to feed him. She's going to feed the other baby that's still in the cavity. And he can hardly believe it. So then we got a great shot of the whole fam family. That's the male, that's Papa on the upper right, and then the female and the two babies. So it was a fabulous, fabulous deal. Not including this season, up until last season, there were five breeding seasons. This one male, who's the most industrious, hardworking little guy I've ever seen, made 11 cavities. They had 10 broods. They fledged 29 chicks two parents, one living dead tree. So please create and save snag trees. This is what you can have in your backyard. This is what you can provide for. And these are other folks that, um, you know, other, other beings that lived in the tree, the Eastern screech owl, they really blend in well. Also these have perched on the tree. And one year I had an Eastern gray squirrel and she had a white morph baby in the snag in an old cavity that the woodpecker made. And other residents in the snag, this is the Eastern screech owl. This is my snag. It has broken off twice over the past seven seasons. Uh, this particular female Eastern screech owl I know well. And this is what she had in the cavity uh, last season. There are four. One of them in the middle there has his head tucked down. They all survived. Um, that's another long story, but they all survived and they all fledged. So how do I begin? Now I have all this information and I really don't know how to begin. So it's super easy. Three easy steps. Call your native plant society or look at their website because they have the native plants for this area. Every community has it. Broward County has an excellent, excellent native plant society and very good website, it's, it's been very well run. And also please look up National Audubon Society website. They, you can put in your zip code and it pulls up the native plants in your area and the specific birds those plants supply for. So they have a very, very good website, National Audubon Society. And then the next thing, you know, let's say you have a big grassy lawn and you're like, well, I don't know where to start. Just start planting them from the edges, dig up grass, Put in plants that you found out from those two websites previous that we just showed and just start planting but start planting just like these just like these folks did they just dug up some grass and started planting in from the edge and another thing you want to do is uh, try to reduce your lawn by at least 50 percent and you can add create islands so you plant in from the edge create islands with trees bushes flowers grasses all the way down to bare ground 
And third, leave weedy and brushy areas. So whatever you have that's kind of not real uh, tidy, that's okay. Somebody in your, somebody in your household is going to be happy about that. But that lady said we could leave a mess in there. So if you leave these weedy, brushy areas, if you leave a little bit of untidiness or weeds, if you build it, they will come. If you leave it, they will stay. So really, 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 your backyard matters. I would suggest you plant like the planet depends on it, because it does. And when you provide a safe, healthy environment for the birds, or the year-round birds, the migratory birds, our summer birds, they will stand up and with all their heart, they will say to you, thank you. And um, I can see the chat. If there are any questions, I'd, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Unfortunately, I've lost my uh, little cursor, so I can't move the chat box to where I can see it better, but I'll play a workout. If there are any questions. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, tall trees take a long time to grow. So what do you recommend to start with? Because unfortunately my back backyard has a good size, but when we moved here, they all they planted is uh, palm trees. So, and tall trees, yes, we would like, but you know, they take a long time. So what 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 would be the first besides the palm trees? Well, they I don't think they do much, but what kind of what kind of palm tree? Um, I think I don't know the name. I can um I can just put my camera quickly so you can see me. A quick little tip, too, that um, we've kind of had a lot of success here at the South Florida Wildlife Center is if you uh, use any of the apps like Nextdoor, things like that, some people are uprooting trees in their backyards to put in pools, change landscaping. If you put a request in, you might actually get a mature tree uprooted. Yes uprooted and delivered to you um, oh okay that's a good idea yeah we've, because we've i know got, they take a long time yeah yeah we've gotten a, a several donated recently to us at the south florida wildlife center uh, because a volunteer made a request so you know you might you might find out that in your neighborhood somebody is willing to pass you on a, a beautiful large tree yeah yeah and 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 by the way the, the palms that i have i don't know what type but they are not the ones like the coconut palm or the ones that you find at the beach they are like smaller okay well a very a very 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 good tree is the sable palm that is our state tree that's the number mm -hmm. three uh the number three tree for wildlife in the state it's sable really of sables that's our state tree you don't want mm -hmm. to trim it up St sables like many palms are self-cleaning you don't need to cut the fronds um, but what I would do is I would build on what you have. So start from, you don't need the whole canopy and, a, and, and palms are fine depending on the type of palm. Um, some provide much more for birds than others. But I would, I would start on that and then start building your understory. So um, plants around the palms have, you know, come out, I don't know how big your yard is, but come out 10, maybe 15 feet from around the palms. Dig up your grass, start putting in native plant species. If the palms create enough shade, you can put in shade plants like wild coffee is fantastic. Cocoa plum is wonderful. Myrcene is a wonderful understory plant. I don't list all the different plants for all the different birds because you can look that up on, on the websites that I gave you. Yeah. Um, but I would just, you know, the, the best thing to do is just start. And you probably will, you know, you probably put the wrong plant in the wrong place and you'll learn and you'll, and you'll correct it but you already have palms and most importantly, you have the desire to do something. So that's, yeah. That's also, super good. also wild coffee uh, grows very quickly, very well. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the, the time of year where there's going to be a lot of water and a lot of sunshine. So plants are really going to take root and do really well. Um, so yeah, I like so the I idea of, uh, yeah, uh, planting around the the, the palms. I, I like that idea. Yeah, I must start with that one. Because mm -hmm. I do have a lot of palms. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. All righty. 
Any other questions? Okay, I guess we answered it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Anne, for, for providing this lecture for us. Uh, I think you definitely inspired a lot of people, uh, including myself. I think uh, this weekend I will be adding to the backyard foliage. Um, if anybody else has any questions or wants to review this, um, this video, we will provide it on YouTube. Uh, the link will be there. And if you have any questions, you can email me and I can get a hold of Anne at any time. I actually had a question, but oh. I couldn't type in the chat fast enough. Oh, okay. Um, I have a very, I mean, my backyard and my front yard, the whole place is opposite of, of this entire lecture. And I, you know, I'd like to make adjustments to that. I live on a canal and we tend to get inundated with iguanas, especially if you are creating that soft soil and now they're gonna to wanna to dig. Uh, do you have suggestions for deterring that from occurring? Julie, you wanna take that one? Um, I think uh, there's a couple of things. There are three iguana varieties here in South Florida. So the green iguana, they seem to eat, they're, they're just her herbivores. They seem to eat more of the um, non-native plants. Uh, a lot of times people find resolution in just not, in just planting native. It's a little too tough for them. Uh, granted, that's not a blanket statement. There are some native foliage that they do like. It, I know it's really difficult on the waterway. Um, they just, that's where they congregate. Uh, for the other two varieties, the more, the spiny tail and the Argentinian tegu, uh, those do burrow under um, the structures. I think that's what you're, you, you seem to have, correct? Yeah, they wanna burrow right along the seawall there. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we're constantly filling with rocks and things, but I don't want to create too much of a soft, inviting environment for them. Uh huh. I, I where... also is this is this Erica who's speaking? This, no. This. Okay. Um, I also live on the canal, and uh, I also have some iguanas, but I have two dogs that really don't like iguanas, and so that is very effective. Um, as we all know, iguanas are invasive, exotics, non-natives, and shouldn't be here. Um, <clears throat> and I guess different people have different systems for that, but um, they, they really should not be, uh, be here. Unfortunately, people have let them go and they've bred. But if you have a dog, which it doesn't sound like you do, they can be really the good. Pitbull was great until she passed away. We didn't have ducks, iguanas, nothing in the yard. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. You know, so um, I think, yeah, that I think was people, the best. I think Julie's suggestion is great in planting natives. I have found that a lot, a lot of my plants are not eaten by iguanas. Um, and I have a lot of natives. I don't have all natives, but I have a lot. So I would go with that. Um, I think that's a really good suggestion. Try to put in more natives. And, um, you know, I think you can put things out there. People put out little wind, windmill, those little- Yeah, windmills. CD oh, discs, oh. hanging CD discs uh, yeah. does work for a little while because that reflection um, really catches them off guard. FWC, um, they kind of do a species profile. They have some tips. They also have some hotlines, but it's a problem we can't, we haven't found a solution to here in South Florida. So right. I know, you know, we're struggling to find an answer, you know, to, to fixing this problem. Yeah, mm -hmm. there are definitely plants that they don't eat because yes. I have a lot of plants in my yard that do not get eaten by them. Um, wild coffee is one of them, cocoa plum, uh, silver buttonwood, um, myrcene. These are all really nice uh, uh, Bahama coffee, the, the miniature coffee. Uh, they do tend to like firebush unfortunately, which is a really good bird and butterfly and pollinator plant. Um, and they like uh, bougainvillea. <laughs> yeah, they love that, yes. White bird of paradise. White bird of paradise is, is not a native plant, but it is an, it's, it's not an invasive exotic and it's perfectly acceptable to plant. Uh, it is a huge bird magnet. I have- Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. It's called white bird of paradise. Okay. It looks, it looks a little bit like a banana uh, plant. Mm. Um, and it has the big, bird, the big flowers that are very, they have, um, you know, the orange bird of paradise. We kind mm -hmm. of think of that as a Hawaiian flower. 
Uh, those also grow here. But the white bird of paradise is much taller and um, a, really a good bird magnet. And I've never had an iguana in my white bird of paradise. So they're different, different plants um, that you can try that, that should not attract them. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, any other questions? I oh, will thank you everybody for joining us. This was very fun and informational. Lots of good information and tricks and tips. Um, stay tuned for upcoming classes. We will have a class coming up next month around the same time. And um, it will be a very interesting one. Thank you so much. Have a great day.